Welcome, Pudding People, to another episode of Everybody Loves Pudding. I have to say, I am an excited and ecstatic uh, host today. I, I, I don't even have words to really articulate how happy I am to have our guest. She is a an actress. She is a producer. She has been in probably at least two or, I don't know, 200 of your favorite video games that you've ever played. She is Sumali Montano. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I, I, Like I said, I'm just super pumped. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I will say, um, while you, you pronounce my name as my family does, Sumali, uh, but another pronunciation of my name is Sumali, which uh, is one that I use more in work, but I, I, I totally... I totally welcome both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always worried about that because I have a distinct and profound uh, inability to pronounce so many names. And I'm always just terrified that I'm going to mess up because that's you, you, you just stand there and you got that, that, that wash out, all the blood just gone from your face at that point. It's like, I have just completely messed everything up now. Not at all. You're so sweet. Thank you for, thank you for being, um, thank you for being so welcoming and having me here. Well, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm ecstatic. Now, I, I have to start with something very basic. And anytime I get a chance to speak to anybody, the industry is, is wonderful. But it's even better to me when I talk to somebody that has been doing things for as long as you have and been involved in so many cool things where your beginnings do not, you know, seem like the thing that that straight shot into the world of acting. You you started on a completely different path. Uh, you were a Fulbright, uh, Fulbright scholar. That's kind of amazing. You, did, was it the Philippines that you went to for that scholarship? It was. Um, when I was in college, um, actually since I was in high school, my dream was to travel around the world. But I did not grow up in a family that could afford something like that. And so when I was in college, my my kind of way to get to travel was all right i'm going to apply for every scholarship under the sun that i can find um to get me to travel and my interests really were to discover my roots and so i applied specifically to uh scholarships in thailand and scholarships in the philippines and it just so worked out that the fulbright scholarship to the philippines came through and i got to spend a year working and studying there what is that like? You know, you hear about a lot of these, a lot of these scholarships and, and things, and because so many of us don't have the the firsthand experience, or even people that we know that have been involved with it, it it kind of doesn't it doesn't resonate. When you're going, it, it's my understanding that part of the the scholarship is teaching English in in another country. Is is that accurate? Uh, no, and I am. I, I have to just say, I am so glad that you asked about this because not many people talk to me about this. And yet it's the fact that I was a Fulbright scholar is one of the key things that got me into producing because uh, some of the people I was pitching the movie, the deal to, they, they looked at all of my accomplishments in the business and were like, okay, okay, okay. But for some reason they, they honed in on the fact, wait, you're a Fulbright scholar. Oh, okay. We trust you to tell this story. I was like, oh, okay. You never know what it's going to be, right? And so <laughs> I'm loving that you asked me about this. Um, I'm sure there are there are some scholarships where uh, you you do spend your time abroad teaching English. I'm sure of it because I I know I know I applied to some of them. Maybe not scholarships so much as uh, actual jobs like teaching in American schools abroad. But the U.S. Fulbright uh, scholarship is specifically designed for um, American scholars, or in my case, just graduated seniors from college to, to study abroad. And so you have to apply with uh, a proposal for what you're gonna study in that host country. Oh. Um, and then you have to apply to, in your application, you have to associate yourself with uh, an institution of higher education. In my case, it was the University of the Philippines and specifically the Women's Studies Department. And you have to show that like, okay, this is a legit project that I want to study. And then you have to, then you have to write a big paper on it and then present it. And so uh, in exchange for this kind of uh, 
it, it's a it's a cultural exchange really so like the american student goes abroad studies a topic that's relevant to that to that country i get to learn more about the country and the culture and the people and then you know in turn the people that i interact with you know get to learn more about the united states through my interaction with them but it was a fantastic program because it lasted eight or nine months uh the scholarship gave me enough money to actually do a proper study it wasn't like okay here's your plane ticket and here's you know a hundred bucks a month good luck you know uh they actually and they provided so much support um both from the like academic sense but uh you know just because there were a bunch of U.S. Fulbright scholars at, there at the same time. And so we got to kind of vibe off of each other and support each other. But I did this whole project. And at the end, I had to present it to the committee and to all these people. And I invited my friends. But, you know, while I was there, I also had time to, like, just be be, be me, be a person. And I made friends. And I had, like, light, you know, friends that have just meant so much to me and stayed with me since then. I feel like lifelong friends. So. I got to I got to have both the the social aspect and the academic aspect. What was maybe your biggest takeaway? Maybe something to do with the culture that you weren't expecting or that really just resonated with you while Dang, you're... I love your questions. I love this. This is not what I expected to start talking about and I'm I'm so thrilled. Uh I know immediately what it is. Um I went to the Philippines as an American to learn about my roots. And I I did, I learned so much about the culture and history of the country that my mom was born in. But at the end of the day, the thing that I took from that experience was, um, you know, like no matter how hard I tried to fit in there, because I wanted to uh, learn to speak enough of the language to get by and not, you know, not get shortchanged when I was on a big bus, you know, like I, I could speak it well enough and uh, sound like a local. But at the end of the day, for better and for worse, I'm an American. That, you know, that that to me was like both. It was everything because, you know, when you're younger and you're like searching your roots and you you think you might have found something, you're like, oh, wow, this is so cool. I want to be like that. And then and then you're like, no, wait, no, this is home. America is home. When you were there, did were you already aware of your your great uncle's accomplishments at that point? Were you able to kind of have a chance to? I, I have to assume that there there's got to be uh, something that's there that you could see. It's like, oh, here's the mark where you know whether it's a statue or you know uh, a theater named after him yep. you know some of were you able to see some of the impact that that he had had um you know i have to say i didn't i i grew up hearing so many stories uh about about him and my grandmother who uh was an actress in the philippines i didn't i didn't see I didn't see the theater actually where so many of his plays were, were performed. I should have now come to think of it, but it gives me something to do when I go back. Uh, the thing that I did was actually visit the provinces um, where my, where my family came from. And so uh, most of the time I was, I was stationed in Manila, the capital. Um, but because the, of the nature of the Fulbright scholarship, they want you to explore, they want you to travel. So I actually learned how to scuba dive. <laughs> while I was there. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it took me to so many cool places and to, to get to see the natural beauty of the country uh, and then have a whole set of friends who are my diving buddies. Um, that was really special. And then, you know, I think I took the bus. I feel like I took the bus. Maybe I flew, I can't remember now. But I went to the northern part of the country, um, Ilocos, which is the province where my my grandmother and grandfather are from, and I saw like I saw the 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 big land markers and a, a land a lamp post I think that was kind of dedicated to my to my like my Lolo, which is grandfather in Filipino. That, that's kind of awesome. So okay, so you've gone through this entire awesome experience, been able to immerse yourself in the culture. You come back to the United States and then kind of immerse yourself in business. Not quite. I mean, you were you pulling mean. out all the right, uh, all the right things. I mean, that was exactly my mind was spinning because my research topic in the Philippines, 
I, I actually, you know, spent a lot of time in the squatters areas. You know, these are people with nothing, you know, the, some of the people that I would um, hang out with would be like a family of four and their dinner, their dinner for the family of four was one package of ramen noodles. Uh, it's a, it's totally fine. Um, uh, we'll but, cut that out. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's fine. But you know, a family of four with one package of ramen noodles, and that, and and they were so kind and generous and always saying, "Ate sumali," you know, please eat more, eat more. And I, 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 I couldn't. Ate is like big sister, uh, uh, is what you call a big sister. And so I was like, "No, no, 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 I can't, I can't." Um, but then to go from that world to Wall Street was really freaking hard i mean i i i I, you nailed it like it was really mentally difficult for me you know and just to get thrown back into a world where i'm like okay high pressure business wearing suits and you know dealing with hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on the line and if i make one little rounding error that could (laughs) you know in my financial model that could blow the whole deal and you know so it was tough it was really really hard so once you've got these these completely disparate experiences and from what i've from what i've read you took some time to travel and that feels like a very very clearing experience to try and to try and center yourself to figure out where you where you fit where you want to go how did you come to the conclusion that acting was the answer this is a real this is a true story and my friends kind of tease me about it now this is a true story um about three quarters the way around my my round the world trip Uh, i finally after investment banking i finally had enough money to make my dream come true from high school. And I threw in a backpack and I bought one of those round the world tickets as you can change the time and the date of wherever you go. But like, you have to make sure that you keep going in one direction. You can't backtrack. So as long as you keep circling the globe, you're okay. Uh, And about three quarters of the way through, I found myself on the East coast of Africa on a giant barge that was sailing from Mombasa to Zanzibar. I was on a barge because it was the cheapest way to get there. And the group of backpackers that I had found, we read in the, I think it was like the Lonely Planet book. We read, well, if you offer them like 20 bucks, they'll usually let you, you know, hang out on the boat and make that, make that, it's an overnight trip. You know, it's not, I can't remember how long it was, but like 36 hours or something, a uh, trip from, from Mombasa to Zanzibar. And so I did that. It was the worst night of my life. (laughs) We didn't understand why there were no other boats sailing at this time. Because the the guidebook was like, oh, there's tons of boats. You just go down to the, you know, go down to the docks and pick a boat that looks like, you know, fun and safe and go, go on that. There was only one boat. And we quickly realized why. It's because that is not the time to be sailing. The Mm -hmm. seas are so rough. It was, I don't know of any one of us. We were a group of um, a group of six women I don't think any of us survived without throwing up multiple times that night and so in that early morning after like throwing up all night it I woke up early and I went to the I went to the uh the deck and like looking out and it's just that time when dawn is starting and you just start to see the colors and it's like the pinks and the light blues of the sky start coming up and it literally just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, oh my God, I've always loved acting, but I've never had the courage to pursue it. Wait a minute, I can do that. You know, cause you're, you're out of your normal element when you're traveling, you know, everything around the world is different and, and you're able to see things differently and all your senses are so alive. And then especially that night I'd like thrown up everything. And so I was just like, well, I just an empty, I don't know, empty, empty person. And I just, I stood there and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I want to be an actor. I, I want to be an actor. And I, I shit you not. In that moment, <laughs> dolphins start jumping no. out of there. I am, I am dead. 
dead serious. They start leaping out of the water. And I'm like, oh my God, I have to take, this is, a, this is a freaking sign. What? What is happening? And the entire crew um, comes up. They, they heard me. The entire crew rushes up to the deck. Everybody wakes up and everyone's so excited because the dolphins are, are racing, running, running beside the boat. And, uh, and then we found out later from the captain that it was very rare for the dolphins to be doing that at this time also. So mm. I was like, okay, I, I have to do it. The dolphins told me to. <laughs> Universal sign accepted. Yes. And so now some of my friends will, will tease me and be like, ah, 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 ah. you're an actor, <laughs> Sumali. Ah, ah. Uh, I guess the only thing that could have been more obvious if it maybe a crustacean started a, a, a singing and dance number. I, I'm I'm really not sure. It uh, is a true story. <laughs> uh, that is that is phenomenal. So all right, so you've got the you've got the purpose in hand. You've you've done your traveling. You come back to the states. Okay, how do you start? Yeah, you know, I know what I want to do. How do I get from point A to point B? What is something that maybe you didn't realize was part of the industry. So some of the learning steps that you, that you kind of experienced as you began your path to where mm. you are now. I, I'm trying to remember what I did first, but uh, the, the first thing that comes to mind that comes to mind, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I love studying and um, I bought a book. <laughs> and it was um it was a book it was a book written by Elaine Clark who's still in the business it's up in San Francisco and um it was called how to make money with your voice hmm. uh and it was all about voiceover acting because even though like I wanted to be an actor um I specifically started in voiceover because I felt that voiceover wouldn't be as limiting to me because at the time, this is, you know, 20, 25 years ago now, I, there just weren't that many roles and opportunities for Asian actors. Um, so I thought, let me try voiceover because people can't see what I look like. And I grew up in Ohio. So I know I, you know, like I, I, I have, I, I sound like, you know, uh, I could be, you know, from, anywhere in America um but well maybe not the south but anyway that's another that's another side tangent accents regional can emulated. <laughs> I can put it on I can put on that southern Ohio twang but uh yeah so I bought a book and the book was great it outlined for me things that I didn't realize like you know you start off like oh I want to be a voiceover actor but you have no idea how many segments within the voiceover industry there are there's promo there's animation there's anime there's uh, you know, there's commercial, there's video games, and each one requires its own separate study. It's it's a craft in and of itself. So uh, I bought a book and I took a lot of classes. So uh, if you if you're hearing that, dear listeners, uh, to to be a good voiceover uh, uh, artist, uh, you have to study just as much uh, as you would for your trigonometry test. Uh, <laughs> I studied a lot less for trigonometry. I don't even know what trigonometry is anymore. Uh, there are some letters and lines. That's also really important. <laughs> um, all right. So your big, your first big, well, what was your first big break in terms of, I have a, a prominent role in a television series, cartoon, video game. You go, hey, that's me. Where, where did you begin? I'd say my first big break was booking a recurring role as a nurse on the show, the award-winning show at ER, if, uh, view if viewers, if listeners remember that. Um, ER, ER broke the mold. I mean, it was revolutionary at its time, you know, and they didn't, they had one, they had one recurring, uh, Asian nurse, but they didn't have any Filipina nurses. And I was the first uh, Filipina nurse. And of course, you know, nowadays you can go into any hospital and I, I'd say the the, the number one uh, ethnic subgroup of nurses um, after white is Filipina. So uh, it was, it was actually a real honor 
um, to get to play that role and in, on, a, on a show that was as mainstream and as recognized and um, lauded as ER. Well, and I feel, at least to me, that there must have been some sort of reaction when people started experiencing your work and the, the tone of your voice and the way that you did things, that there was a certain amount of, um, I don't know if gravitas is the right the right word, but a certain amount of just um, you want to believe what you are saying. Because I noticed you tend to get certain role types more often than others. I see a lot of newscasters and doctors, you know, people that you want to trust and believe. And do you think that has something to do with with the way that you kind of portray your characters? Um, I think I think it's twofold. Uh, I definitely think that I like to think there's something that I bring to those characters. Like, I kind of like to think I'm intelligent, <laughs> uh, smart, um, that people should trust me. Um, so I think part of it is personal, but I do think there's an element, um, it, well, specifically because you mentioned newscasters and doctors, uh, there is an element of those were the types of roles that people were open to seeing Asians for. It wasn't, um, you know, uh, we don't see too many Asian women in in roles like we do in the deal, you know, it, it's, no. it, it's taken a long time. So, so it, it, it's both, I think. Yes, I bring that to the I bring that to my characters, uh, and there is some part of every actor brings part of themselves to each role, uh, but also what opportunities there were available. Sometimes I think I both benefit and suffer at the same time from being part of the general public in the year twenty twenty two. I have been a fan of uh, martial arts films for a long time, and of course Bruce Lee was always. He was the man. Amazing. He's always one of my favorites. And then finding out the story behind how the show Kung Fu came to be and how that was originally, it was his idea and the studios just, well, well, we can't do it because uh, yeah, people won't watch. It's like, why? Why wouldn't they watch it? He was awesome. Right, right. I just have to remind myself, 2022, uh, <laughs> progress has been made. Uh, maybe maybe not as much as as we would like but uh yeah but definitely yeah progress progress is definitely being made yeah so what what was your there's always going to be an instance where you work with somebody whether it's another actor a director uh, a producer early on in your in your work whether in tv or in voice work was there somebody that you just clicked with immediately and it just kind of was one of those instances where you it, it made doing what you were doing just so much better than it could have been on its own Ooh, this is a business where collaboration is everything so it's tough to think of one person because every job i feel like there is that person or people that you connect with that make you better and that's part of what I love about the business no job is the same and um I mean in a in general I would say my coaches yeah I mean they're you know the equivalent of my teachers everybody's a teacher um you can learn something from everyone but uh my coaches is is really who I would who I would who I would point to because the business is so competitive um, and with for me anyway without having coaches who could help me make my audition stand out from the crowd or you know give it that extra little something that no one else is doing those are the things that, you know, lead to, lead to booking the jobs and lead to being able to sustain myself as in, in my career, doing a career that I love. What did you learn from maybe, maybe for one of our listeners that might be looking to go into the industry? Mm -hmm. 
what did you learn from one of these coaches as just a, a little tidbit of wisdom when you're trying to put together some of these auditions? Um, that... Okay, I'll give you two that the first two that come to mind. One, in, uh, I have a coach named John. I had a coach named John Howard Swain in San Francisco, and uh, he's actually still teaching. And he taught me, if you're not using it, you're losing it. Meaning, if you're not strengthening your acting muscle every day, either in class or on set or doing something, that muscle is atrophying. So I grew up with the notion that um, I always needed to be in class. Like the only time that I could not be in class uh, was when I was already doing the work every day as my regular job. So I you know, I was already, I was using it. Um, that's a big one. And the second one, I'm going to credit my coach, Stan Kirsch, who passed away a few years ago, um, but truly shaped so much of my career uh, in Los Angeles. He gave me so many, so many tidbits of wisdom but the one that um, that's coming to mind right now, which I assume is why it's coming to my mind and I need to share it uh, for whoever out there might need to hear it. This business is so full of huge ups and huge downs. And it's, uh, it's really, it's a challenge to weather. You know, you could be walking down the street, eating your frozen yogurt one day, and the next day you're flying off to shoot a film opposite the biggest movie star you can think of. And you book the gig and you're there. Uh, you can also be on the precipice of doing that and then get the call. Sorry, the studio changed their mind. You will no longer be <laughs> living out your dream job. Mm. Uh, and it happens so frequently. And I think so much of being able to be be a professional in this business and to last for as long as you can gets back to the advice that Stan gave me, which is, um, it's not, I'm not going to, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not going to quite say this right. It is about learning how to weather the ups and downs, but the way to weather it is not to, not to go from up here and to down there, up and down, like go the whole range. It's to learn how to kind of like compress reduce, yeah compress or reduce reduce the <laughs> reduce the velocity and the, the 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 height and the height of the high and the low of the low it's it's weird there's something about it that that i'm still figuring out because you want to embrace all of the little things that the wins and you know that you can get as, as small as they can because you don't ne ever know when the next one is coming but I think there is something to understanding that this is the job. And so it doesn't have to, the highs don't have to like blow your mind and the lows don't have to stomp on your soul and crush your heart. You know, it's, this is the job. This is what we signed up for and includes this, this ride, but it's learning how to navigate that. I have to assume that there would at least be one kind of nice part of what it is that you do as you go along and create help to create these characters and these stories that you amass uh, more and more people that appreciate your work. Now, I, I'm sure that most of them already know where to find you, but let us say I were unaware of how to follow you on social media. <laughs> how would I find you to find out what your newest projects were and what's going on with you? I probably live on Twitter the most. Uh, I'm trying to live on Instagram even more, uh, but those are the two places that that my social media addiction tends to find itself. <laughs> uh, but I can be found at sumali.com, S-U-M-A-L-E-E-D-O-T-C-O-M. Somebody had already taken Sumali. I was bummed. Yeah. I had to come up with something different. Uh, that 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 kind of plays into uh, a lot of people's choices nowadays. You 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 take you take what you can get, but you're still you're still original enough that you're not liking having to do Sumali thirty seven panda. 
That's true. This is true. And I did get sumali.com as my URL. So that I, I snagged that URL for my website early. It's mine. Well, <laughs> that, off of the Sumalis. It is, it's a very nice website. It's, it's very, very cleanly put together. Oh, uh, now, it of needs course. to be updated quite a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's that's it, there's time for that. You've got other things, you've got big things brewing <laughs> that we're going to be talking about here in a minute. Uh, but of course, dear listeners, if you have not already uh, realized, uh, you can find the pudding guys on Twitter and Instagram as well. But more importantly, stop by our website, everybody loves pudding.com. Don't forget, we have some very unique tools on our website. Not only can you find out who is going to be on the upcoming podcast episodes and find out uh, what we have rated previous uh, films that we have done reviews for, but you can take a look at our uh, ultimate comic movie database. Every film ever based on a comic book, comic strip, uh, it is it is all up there and cross-referenced. All of the directors, all of the actors, you can find out what you need to know, who's been in the most. It's probably not who you think. And then, of course, last but not least, you can take advantage of the pop culture death counts. Did you watch Avengers Infinity War and wonder exactly how many people died on screen and don't really want to count it yourself? Well, I've already done it for you. How many? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to go to the website to find out. <laughs> exactly. Like uh, like millions. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, just take a, take a look at the website. We got great stuff for you. Um, all right, back back to it. Uh, talking about uh, some of the big stuff that you've done in the past, I I have to say that I'm I'm a bit of, or at least I was a bit of a gaming nerd, so I have to bring this bring this up. There is a certain game that I go back to regularly. That uh, just it's if I need to to calm down and well maybe not calm down if I want to just randomly shoot things on a screen for some Release. reason. <laughs> it really is a little bit. I always go back to Fallout 4 and you had oh, some, wow. you had like one of the, well, it's not that just one of the, you, obviously you did some of the Gunner voices, but you have one of the juicier story bits in, in that, uh, in that game because you had to go looking for it in the Nuka Cola expansion, but uh, you had such a, a fun, did they tell you about what this kind of storyline was going to be before you got into it? No. And in fact, I, I literally, as you were telling me, I was like, oh God, I hope he's going to tell me what I did because I don't quite remember. I will say though, that I, I remember that the fallout session was really cool. Uh, my The recording sessions. Um, I remember, I don't remember who directed me, but I remember them being amazing. And I remember getting to go to some emotional places that other games um, and that, that I, that I hadn't been able to go to in other games. So, but I don't remember the storyline. Your character was uh, uh, one of a handful of people that were trapped at a at the Nuka World. Uh, oh, I, I'm a scientist. That's right. Okay, it's coming back to me. Keep going, keep going. So, so one of the side effects of the radiation they had in the game is that some individuals didn't die. Instead, they had prolonged life at the expense of looking like uh, essentially zombies. Uh, and generally speaking, you can run into some that will try and kill you and some that just are like normal people. But cool. what you what your character eventually finds out is that all of them eventually deteriorate. And oh. your character is in the process of that deterioration and oh. has, has a kind of a, a, a love interest that is also there and doesn't know how to kind of break it to him and is going to try and go off and find some sort of a cure. And, wow yeah so do i um do i send out that last like distress call like before i totally get engulfed well that that's that's a good that's a good thought and you would think that that would be the, the way it would go but with fallout it's uh usually a lot more depressing than that so <laughs> if if you go through the uh, through the <laughs> nuka cola expansions you, you uh -huh. find the last tape that that is left and this is what i'm doing you just trip over your body somewhere in the in the oh. fallout wasteland un, unable to have uh oh, finished what you wanted to do nothing <laughs> but, yeah oh that's heartbreaking it is but it's one of the better story tidbits and i was like oh i i, I thought i recognized I, I i start to draw connections from voices between that and uh and other things like the uh, you yeah again in mass effect 3 you had a fantastic role in the in uh 
and basically some DLC content that didn't come with the base game. But that one I thought was kind of interesting. And I kind of wanted to know this has to be something that you run into regularly with voice acting. So in the, in the mass effect three uh, playing Nyreen Kandros, mm-hmm. it's a, it's an alien that does not have, let us say normal human facial features. So a lot of, well, not a lot of everything basically has to be conveyed over voiced did you have like extra direction or did they say hey this is this is basically what your character needs to say and do take it where you need to take it how do they kind of go with that when when they can't exactly cgi they can't really program those facial cues those those emotional cues that we can normally see when we talk to each other um i i feel like working in video games is is a wonderfully unique challenge and world in and of itself. Uh, I think what you're what you're talking about, or the way I'm hearing it, is there's a wonderful balance between having the right, usually the writer or uh, whoever's um, kind of overseeing the story uh, is on the is at the session, plus the voice director who is you know understanding the entirety of the game and where each storyline needs to go and what you know how it's paying off here and there uh both of those people to me are critical in a video game session because they'll both give me the context uh that i need to to do the performance because there's not enough time really to explain the expanse of the game and you know so video game voiceover actors we 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 are expected to kind of like jump in at at any point in the story and give a very specific performance about what's happening in that moment uh and then literally be able to go from that to ooh now you're doing a different character and you're at the end of the game and this is you know with and i i actually find it so meditative because I'm in a session and I um, there's so much to take in between the information that the writer is giving me. It's like, okay, this is what your character's like. This is what they're, you know, this is kind of like a, a rough overview of their backstory. I always ask, what, how do I feel about the characters that I'm interacting with? Do I love them? Do I hate them? Do I want to help them? Do I want to hinder them? Do I like, what's, what's the, how do I feel? That's key for me. Um, and then painting like where we are. So I I get all that information and then, you know, and then hopefully deliver, deliver what they know. It's a, it's a really great game of game. I don't know if that's right word, but there's a lot of trust that has to happen, you know, cause I don't necessarily, I don't know as much as they do about the vision and arc of the whole thing. Uh, but I still have to perform it in a way that feels authentic and real to that moment. And with Nyreen, it was funny. I remember Carol, Caroline Livingston, who uh, directed me on that. And I just remember that one of the first things she said was she's like, okay, this is the first female Turian in this world. People are going to go wild over this. So <laughs> I, and I think she, she said it in a way that was like, this is really exciting. And all I could hear was, oh my God, I better do a great job. <laughs> oh, the pressure, the pressure. <laughs> but she was great. And in that, in that, that, in that session, they had I'm I play opposite Carrie Ann Moss, right? Yeah, you, well, yeah, you've got uh, your character is in a relationship with like a cornerstone secondary character. Yeah. In in Mass Effect Three, uh, that, yeah, that runs the Omega uh, space station basically ruthlessly, and you, you know you were two hey. people that were together, and then then we're not all of a sudden, and it's yes. in the middle of the war, and you've got to deal with relationship issues while fighting you know evil aliens and things like that yeah in in this case it doesn't always happen but in video games and this one i remember they had her lines so i could actually play off of her lines probably 90 percent of the time i don't get that you know you 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 have to hear it in your mind and sometimes i'll ask oh hey who who's the voice actor that uh, you know that voices this character because i there's chances are i might know them and so that i can at least have an idea of how it sounds you know being said and how I could hear it in my mind's ear and then respond to it uh, appropriately. That was, it made it a lot more fun. I, that was one of the better, the down, one of the better downloadable uh, bits of content. All right. I, I only have one more before we get into 
uh, talking about the the pretty cool new film that you are part of. But I have to ask this again, otherwise the the sun will will hit me with something. <laughs> um, now, because of the time frame, being from Ohio, where you were, you would have been in a position to be a prime recipient of the early Transformers cartoons. Did you know about any of this history? Were you a fan of any of this before you got to voice like one of the, the, the coolest characters in Transformers on Transformers Prime? Yay. Um, thank you for asking me that. Uh, it was such that that really marked the beginning of my voiceover career and getting to voice RC in Transformers Prime was it was a transcendent experience for me uh, getting to work with you know the greats the greats frank welker um peter cullen kevin michael richardson steve bloom all those guys uh just amazing i i knew about the transform the 80s transformers cartoon i knew of it uh my cousins my two boy cousins uh were into it i don't remember how much but I knew they had Transformers figures. I was not, um, I wasn't like a, I wasn't like a full on fan at the time though. I, I can't remember really say why <laughs> I was into strawberry shortcake, yeah. <laughs> which is totally funny. different. <laughs> it was a little weird. I mean, to, to be fair, I mean, the origins of the Transformers are strange to begin with when you base a cartoon off of the fact that we have these toys and we don't know what to do with them and we'd like to sell them. Let's make a cartoon. Uh, uh, I thought it was cool though. Yeah, no, I thought it was cool. I just, I think I, if anything, I felt, um, and I actually still feel this way today. I couldn't transform a Transformers toy, like one of the, you know, real complicated ones. I couldn't do that to save my life. So <laughs> I, I was like, I would see these big toys at my cousin's house. I'm like, oh, I, I, I don't know how to play with that. <laughs> Let's go outside and play imaginary Star Trek because I can do that. <laughs> Oh, uh, we'll have to have an entire other conversation about Star Trek because that's 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 my thing right there. I oh, got awesome. gotta love that. Seeing seeing you in Picard was just mm, excellent. Oh, thank you. I was, was so happy to get that role. Yeah, that's having that that show come back in the first place, being able to remind people right? that Star Trek is as cool as it is, and being able to have that modern interpretation. Yes, is 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 really nice. But, and I got to meet Sir Patrick Stewart. I was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, He's just as gracious, gracious and kind as you would want him to be. Yeah, he seems like he'd be pretty awesome. One of those, one of those, one of these days, is it's going to happen. I'm, I'm going to find out. I'm just going to accidentally run into him at the store. <laughs> uh, I believe. <laughs> I trust. I'm putting it out there for you. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's get into this this new film. I I. The whole concept behind it is is another thing that's kind of right up my wheelhouse. I'm I'm a fan of science wow. fiction and a fan of anything that delves into uh, philosophy and sociology, especially in talking about you know concepts like how uh, how uh, utilitarianism could potentially play out in some problematic yeah. ways. Tell me a little about this film and how you got in started production how did how did this whole thing come together Woo, uh that's big okay so first I'll, I'll give you a little synopsis of the world and um the story so the deal takes place in a future world where uh wait wait sorry before i continue we started this process in 2017 we, oh, finished, we finished filming at the end of 2019 so everything that I'm going to say is pre, pre the COVID years. Um, so the world, uh, the world of the deal is set in the future where we've experienced um, a virus worse than anything we'd ever seen before. It, it infects humans, animals, and crops. Uh, that combined with climate change disasters leaves the world, the planet just ravaged. We have so few resources that the um, governing body that arises, we call it the Bureau, 
the Bureau institutes something called the deal. And the deal is basically 20 years for a life. If you want to survive in this world, you can take the deal. You get basic housing, a government job, and food. But in exchange for that, you pay for it with your life. So in 20 years, you have to agree to take your own life. Um, so 20 years for life. And in this world, we meet uh, a mother and daughter, Tala and Annalyn. Tala is a single mom, like my mom in real life is a single mom. Um, the character the character of Tala and Annalyn are based on my mom and me. Uh, Tala took the deal when she was younger, when she was 20. And now she's a few days away from her processing date. Um, and five days before her processing date, her daughter Annalyn gets a medical diagnosis that kind of upends everything, had upends the entire plan that Tala had made and planned out for her daughter so that she could survive after Tala dies. And so now that medical diagnosis sets the team off on, on their adventure to escape the system and save and save their lives. When when you create a story and you use elements from your real life to make it either make it more real or or to make it have that kind of emotional impact, do you run into any difficulties in knowing it's like, well, where do I put that line? How much mm. of, of this do I put into these characters? That's a really great question. Um, so much of my mom and me and our relationship and how we loved each other, the complexities of that and how we fought, so much of us is on screen. Um, I feel like I was able to contribute that part of the story, the authenticity of, the, you know, like this is this is real life, like many scenes, many scenes between us um, that you see on screen came literally from things that happened in in my real life with my mom. Uh, but I have to credit our writer, Sean Prezant. Uh, part of the reason I chose him to write the screenplay with is because he actually knew my mom. So he knew the two of us. Uh, we were friends in college. And it was important to me that I knew I could bring my story and and share that, but the the combination of work of a, I'll call myself a creative producer and a writer is such that the story may live in here, but in order to get it on paper and in a form and in a screenplay that works in you know is that is the craft of a writer. If I had tried to write this thing on my own, we wouldn't even be talking about it. I, it, it like it would take like eight years. <laughs> uh, but my being an actor, and I think and my and me living the story with my mom, those two things allowed me to, uh, to, to creative produce the script. So I could read a scene and be like, nah, this, this is not, this, this is not quite, this is not quite sitting well with me. Let's, let's tweak this or let's tweak that. And working with a professional writer who knows I can, can take a note and then go, oh, I hear what you're saying. Ooh, we could do that, but what if we did this or this? And like, yeah, that works, you know? And then that kind of collaboration is is just magic, electric, I love it. Did you have any literary or uh, movie influences that helped to kind of nudge you in the direction of wanting to tell the story? You know, I after seeing it, you know, of course everybody's like, okay, what's the comp for your movie? And um, I can I can totally see Children of Men I can totally see Logan's Run. Um, Logan's Run was the first sci-fi movie I ever saw. Well, actually, no, Star Wars, and but but the dystopian in the dystopian subgenre. Um, but neither of those, I would neither of those movies directly influenced me wanting to tell this. Really, what influenced me wanting to tell this is um, losing my mom mm. and realizing that you know, in in real life, she always wanted me to help her tell her life story. You know, it's like, you know, as they're, as the parent is aging and it's like, want, you know, wanting to have a memory of what they lived. And I, I felt so bad because I never took the time to help her do that. I bought her like how to, how to write your own autobiography book for Christmas. And I bought her a notebook and I'm like, here, get started. And I, I just didn't feel that's not a medium. Although I, although I feel comfortable writing, writing an autobiography or biography, that's a different medium. 
she never did it. And then a few years after she died, I realized, wait, I can't, I still don't feel comfortable telling her life story, but I can tell a story of how fiercely she loved me. And then that married with an idea that I had percolating in my head about these two people living in this dystopian world. And I was like, oh, okay, now this, this works. Have you had any responses or reactions, I should say, <clears throat> have you had any reactions in the creation process, putting this whole thing together and then eventually getting it to the point where it can be seen, where people start making connections that you didn't anticipate where it affected them in a way that was you yeah. know, either pleasantly surprising or it's like, Oh, I had no idea this would, this would make you react in that way. Uh, I have a couple, I have a couple things. Um, in talking to more people about it, uh, this ha has been a pretty common theme, actually. People are either sci-fi fans or they're not sci-fi fans. And um, I've heard two things. One will, one is, I am not a sci-fi fan, but I loved the film because the story grabbed me. And I, of course, I'm like super, super happy with that. And then the, the converse of that is, I came for the sci-fi. I know Dean Devlin. I know, I know these huge sci-fi worlds. I came for the sci-fi. I stayed for the story. And that to me, um just fills my heart with joy because the thing that um you know when we partnered in very intentionally with electric entertainment and dean devlin and his wife lisa brenner like i knew that i had the i had the emotional story i had the goods in terms of that authentic story but um i did not know how to build a world i knew i wanted sci-fi i knew i wanted dystopian um and what we were hoping for was, which is something that I haven't seen um, a lot of our, like, I feel like we did differently to further the genre is we took a, we took an, an intimate, maybe more even like art house drama ish type of story between two women. And we put it in this big, more commercial, more, you know, uh, recognizable sci-fi world. And we we're trying to carve out an intersection between those two things which is not really done so i feel like we we did something really different and i'm so 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 proud of it when you got the you had the idea you know you've got your writer did you already have in mind it's like okay i know who i want to play x role was there somebody that used to immediately go i gotta have this person and then it turned out exactly the way you wanted or it's like well, i <laughs> thought i wanted this person but then i saw this person and they were awesome and i had to have that person instead uh, interesting um not trying to make any enemies here <laughs> no okay so the, the first thing that comes to mind i really i mean i have to be you know uh honest about this you know i'm an actor and of course I dreamed that I would get to play the role of Tala. You know, she's based on my mom. I'm I'm around the right age for this. So of course I wanted to play her, but I found out in the development process, working with my writer that I gave crap notes when I saw myself playing Tala. I don't know, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure some much more experienced producer can describe this or explain this to me, but I could not give proper feedback on a scene or a few a set of pages when I saw myself as Tala it it just didn't work I don't I don't know why but so early on I figured out I have to remove myself from playing Tala and I had to think about someone else playing Tala and once I did that my ability to read a script and give notes and comments like oh it all came back I was like oh god thank god I, I didn't know what was wrong there for a while it was like out of body experience like what am I saying that's crap you know um but once I started seeing myself just as a producer things came much things flowed much better um so I got so used to not thinking of myself as Tala when I when we pitched the movie to Dean and Lisa at Electric I didn't even pitch myself to play Tala. I never brought it up at all. I was like, here's the list of people. I had this great list of women of color actresses because my mom is a woman of color. That's my one request is that 
we cast Tala as a woman of color. And um, they were cool with that. But then a few days later, Dean came up to me. I was like, you know what? Why don't you just play Tala? You've lived with this character for, you know, two years now. You've, um, she's based on your mom. Who knows this character better than you? But I had never done, I'd never played a lead role, you know, in a film before. So it was a big, it was a big thing. He didn't have to twist my arm, but uh, it, it definitely was a little irk. Uh, and then in terms of the other cast, I feel like I had, I had kind of people in mind or, or not people, but more personalities in mind when we were developing the script. Um, but when we auditioned people, and then uh, my producing partner, Grace Lay and I, we actually flew to London, which is where we cast the film out of and um, met met with our director, Orishi Nagipal, who flew in from Hungary. And we did, you know, callbacks and chemistry reads there. It it became so clear who who needed to be these parts, you know? And, and as an actor, you hear that, you know, like you hear like the producer will say, oh yeah, no, we knew, we knew, we knew. Uh, but I had an experience being on the other side of things. Uh, um, so then being on the other side of things and then actually getting to read opposite the, the different actresses who are up for playing Annalyn, it was, it was really, it was really clear. And uh, I'm so happy with the cast that we ended up with. Did you get that like excited feeling as you're seeing the, the, the people work together? It's like, Ooh, it was oh, ab- like the chill moment. Absolutely. I think, um, I think the first day, the first day of filming was really it. Um, the, the scene at the beginning of the movie where, you know, you're, we're, at, we're in the neighborhood blocks, we call it. And um, it's a huge scene. There's like, I don't know, 80 plus extras, uh, you know, this massive, these massive concrete structures, this amazing brutalist architecture to set the scene for this dystopian movie. And um, that like seeing it there and seeing we had a huge crane shot and like all that like uh, Dean Devlin's there and like all the stuff and <laughs> it's like oh my god we're 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 making this movie this movie that I dreamed of to honor my mom we're making it it was that that was so cool that is kind of an amazing thing I can't wait to see what the response is going to be to it because it, it just came out yeah and and you've still got uh you still got, uh, let us say, uh, an, an array of of different services, or let me rephrase that, an array of different people that have to choose between the different streaming services that they have to realize, like, well, I just got to go on to like onto Freebie or something, and yeah. or onto my Roku and, and watch this and, and get it taken care of. I I, I cannot wait uh, to to see what people think about this film. Thank and you. anytime yeah, me too. you. It's, it, it looks fantastic. Now, I have one final question for you. Mm-hmm. This has nothing to do with anything. Well, it has something to do with something, but nothing to do with that. We like to ask a little something to everybody that comes on the, okay. on the show. You've already done some voice work for some comic-related characters, mm-hmm. uh, uh, being Mira specifically uh, ah, no. and Katana. So if you had your dream of dreams you had the chance to be in a live action production of uh, a comic whether it be you know marvel dc whether it be superhero or not is there a character that you would just absolutely love to portray in live action oh wow gosh i feel like if i my first answer is wonder woman but of course like Gail Gadot plays her so beautifully. <laughs> Gal, sorry, not Gail, Gail. I don't know where I got Gail. Um, but uh, yeah, Wonder Woman. When I was little, um, my parents fought a lot and they got divorced. But when I was little and they would be fighting, I would literally do the, you know, the Wonder Woman spin and be like, I'm going to spin my way out of this and have to not to deal with this crap. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to talk with us today to go over a little bit of your history to tell us about this exciting new movie the deal that everyone has to listen to or every uh, can you tell that my brain is just <laughs> gone okay. that everyone has to watch you got to watch it get on to get on to streaming i mean there's no reason not to take a couple hours to see this fantastic film and 
I really hope the next time you have a, a, a cool project, something coming down the line that you'll take the time, come back on the show. We'll talk about some more. I would love to. I thought your questions were so insightful and wonderful. I really appreciate this conversation. Well, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah.